Good afternoon and welcome to the Ethics of Wearable Tech program. I'm Ira Selkowitz. I'm the director of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. And I'd like to welcome you here today. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Bioethics and Humanities on the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and the Colorado chapter of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which is providing today's CPE continuing education credit. I'd also like to let you know that we're recording today's program and we will send the registrants the link to the recording when it is available. I'd like to begin before I introduce the panelists by telling you a little bit about the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program. But you see on your screen are the principles of the collegiate program. And the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative is named for Bill Daniels. Bill Daniels was a cable television pioneer and also a sports team owner who was very successful in business in no small part due to his ethical business practices. When he passed away, his estate went to form a nonprofit foundation called the Daniels Fund, which has a variety of programs, including the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program, which is comprised of 11 business schools and one law school in the four state region where Bill Daniels did business, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. And an important part of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative is reaching out to the business community, as well, of course, as improving business ed ethics education at the collegiate level. And this program is an example of reaching out, not just to the business community, but to the medical community. So we're very pleased to have so many of you in attendance here with us today. Before I introduce the panelists, I just have a few administrative matters. For any tech-related questions, please use the chat button on your screen. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. We're going to try to take as many questions as we can today. For questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A button. So real quickly, for tech-related questions that you have with the actual webinar on Zoom, please use the chat button. Tech questions, the chat button. Questions for the panelists, use the Q&A button. And now I'm going to welcome our panelists. Pleased to have Danielle Caldwell with us. She is the Data Protection Officer of Strava. And each panelist will be telling you a bit more about themselves and their company. James Malk is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of BioIntelliSense. Eric Campbell, who will be moderating today as a Professor of Medicine and the Director of Research at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities on the University of Colorado's Anschutz Medical Campus. And I also like to thank Matthew Winia, who is the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities for helping us put together this great program. So thank you very much to all of you who are attending and enjoy the program. I'm gonna pass it off now to Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. And I'd like to just pass it off quickly to Matt Winia to briefly introduce the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado. I'll be I'll be really quick. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, it, I just mainly I, I wanted a minute to appreciate Ira and the opportunity to collaborate with the business school, our Center for Bioethics and Humanities, which you see on the screen here, uh, a lovely building. We all miss it a great deal uh, not being able to go in. Uh, and work on site these days with the, with the pandemic. Um, but our center, while physically located on the Anschutz Medical Campus of the University of Colorado, is intended to serve as a hub for the entire university, both the, the Anschutz Medical Campus, but also the Boulder Campus, the Colorado Springs Campus, and of course the downtown campus where Ira uh, sits. And so we really appreciate any opportunity we can to bring together the business community, the law community, um, the history community, the arts and music community across our campuses. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity today to partner with, uh, with Ira and, uh, and his team on, on putting this uh, webinar together. Eric, um, 
I think got a brief introduction a moment ago, but I'll, I just want to brag for a moment that uh, Eric, well, well, you will notice his accent uh, gives away that he is from Minnesota. He spent about the last 20 years at Harvard University, where he was one of the youngest PhDs ever to achieve full professor there. Um, and he's done enormously influential work on conflicts of interest, self-regulation, professionalism in medicine. And it's that history of research and interest in those issues that really made us think he was the perfect person to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. So Eric, thank you for agreeing to do it and I'll turn it over back to you. Thank you, Dr. Winia. Um, it's my pleasure to be the moderator today. I wanna to thank the Daniels Fund Initiative uh, for putting this together. I'd like to welcome all of the participants on the webinar today um, and, and strongly encourage you to participate. I'd like to welcome our panelists, uh, which you will hear from in a minute. And I'd like to begin uh, with Danielle Caldwell. Um, Danielle, if you could just take a brief moment, inter introduce yourself a little bit more fully and uh, your company and then proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Eric. And good afternoon to everyone on the webinar. I'm pleased to be here and uh, happy to introduce myself. And I'm gonna go ahead and start um, sharing my slides if I can. Yeah. And as I do that, apologize for the delay a little bit. So um, for everyone on the webinar, my name is Danielle Caldwell and I currently work as Strava's data protection officer. And um, I'm also an attorney, but I really like to think of myself as a privacy um, advocate or enthusiast. <clears throat> and many of you have never even heard of a data protection officer, uh, I would say that you, you're not alone. Most US companies had never heard of a data protection officer uh, prior to 2018, when they began implementing the General Data Protection Regulation, also known as the GDPR. Um, so I'm gonna go over in a couple slides kind of what I do at Strava, what, what is Strava for those of you guys who are unfamiliar, um, and, and hopefully that gives you a better idea of, of data protection officers too. So as I mentioned, I'm an attorney. So my educational background is in uh, health law. I uh, earned a, a JD um, in concentration in health law and a master's in bioethics from uh, Case Western University. And before I joined Strava, I worked uh, primarily in privacy and regulatory compliance for various healthcare companies. And um, my transition, I would say, into data, data privacy um, has really been the result of kind of my fervent belief that privacy is a human right. And it's something that deserves our attention and our preservation. So that's really what kind of motivates me every day at Strava. So I'll get in to tell you a little bit about Strava. Uh, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar, Strava is a software company. <clears throat> uh, we primarily, we help athletes uh, kind of upload their recreational and commuting activities. Um, so most people know us for biking or cycling and running, but I like to think of if there is GPS or there's heart rate data, uh, you can use Strava to track that activity. And so um, our mission at Strava is to connect athletes to what motivates them and help them find their personal best. And I really love this mission. It's very much athlete centric. And it focuses on a couple of things. Uh, one is that we're helping people become active, um, adventurous, and we're giving them a place um, to record those activities, which uh, is a little bit more about our vision. And our vision at Strava is to be the record of the world's athletic activities and the technology that makes every effort count. Um, if you can imagine, if we wanna be the record of the world's athletic activities, we've got a lot of data. And um, with that data, comes a lot of responsibility in how we handle it, how we protect it, how we inform our users about how we're using their data. Um, I'm gonna go to my next slide to show you a little bit about, um, went too many there. 
I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but uh, this is kind of what Strava looks like from the inside. And if you want more, uh, sign up, download, <laughs> download the app or access our website. Uh, but you can see there, it, it, people use it to track their activities, to record them, to save them, to go back and see how much they've improved over time. And um, with that, we have a lot of data. Um, we welcome athletes from all over the world. Our athletes have uploaded over uh, 4 billion activities. We are very much neutral in terms of like who, which devices can connect with Strava. So we're compatible with over 300. And all of this means, as I said, the more data, the more responsibility that you have for your, for your users or your data subjects. Um, so with that, we, we take privacy very seriously at Strava. Um, in the bottom kind of uh, right-hand corner of your, of your uh, screen, you can see we've got a whole suite of privacy controls and a part of our kind of our overarching privacy program and delivering these controls to, to our athletes is a belief that no matter where you live, uh, we've, we've taken the position that we want to give you the, the most, the most uh, kind of privacy centric controls that are available. Um, so if you live in a country that doesn't have laws that um, specify how companies should use your data, we're still giving you those type of same protections. Um, and most of these protections that our product teams have built um, have really been centered around our data protection principles. And I've highlighted a couple principles here uh, that I believe really kind of align with some of the principles that are um, a part of the Daniels uh, Ethics Funds Initiatives principles. And I'm going to touch on those slightly so you guys can see a little bit more into what I do at Strava. So um, the first of those is transparency. Um, transparency enables control. It enables uh, our users to have autonomy and to really think about how and when they're sharing their data. And um, as, a, as a data subject, you, that means you all. Um, one of the best things that you can do for yourself to protect your data is to read a privacy notice. And I recognize uh, for many of you, that is a very, very long document. It's really boring. Sometimes it's full of a ton of legalese. And what I'm really proud of Strava, which they have kind of pulled together in the last, uh, last year or so, is creating this privacy label. Um, it, it helps people see kind of this, the questions that they really wanna know. Do we sell your personal information? You can see that there's, um, you can, sorry about that, technical thing. You can see that there's a no there. Um, if you were to go on the website and click it, uh, it would take you down to another section that would explain more. And so all, the whole point about being transparent about your privacy practices is so that you can be accountable to your users. Um, which is why accountability is one of our other um, principles that's really important. We disclose our privacy practices so that our users can hold us accountable. They can say, hey, are you guys really doing this? Or can you explain some piece to this, some piece of this to me um, at Strava? We're able to demonstrate our compliance and that's something that I work really hard on. Um, and as you can see, a part of their accountability is appointing a data protection officer, which is my role. And, um, <clears throat> A lot of the work that I do at Strava is really centered around uh, respect for our data subjects rights. So I haven't included all of them here on this slide, but I've, I've highlighted kind of the big ones. This is kind of where my role really focuses around. And I like to think of my job really in, in kind of like four tasks or four areas. Um, and the first of those is being really athlete um, facing and responding to their queries. Um, and also investigating their complaints. So when I hear something, I'm, I'm, I'm going internally and I'm, I'm holding Strava accountable. Uh, the, the second pillar or piece to my role is oversight of compliance. So I'm helping Strava document policies and procedures. I'm helping them implement policies and procedures. Um, and at the same time, I'm also tracking and monitoring and seeing, have we improved? Are we doing better? Can, can we do better? Uh, <laughs> the third part of my, my job is really kind of advising and, and giving advice around uh, the GDPR um, as well. Strava is a global company, which means that we have um, many, many, many laws that focus around data protection. So being a, a resource for our product teams, for our internal uh, teams that handle data, 
Um, and one of the best parts about being a data protection officer is that um, as a lawyer, it's a really unique role. I have the, like, the, the ability to advocate for our users, for their privacy and for compliance with the law in a way that the rest of the lawyers that work at the company, they don't. They work for the company. They advocate on behalf of the companies. Um, on behalf of the business. So that's a, an interest that they have to balance, which I don't. I really am focused on uh, the data subjects or athletes as we like to call them. And the fourth piece of my job is um, liaising with the regulatory authorities. So it's reaching out and asking them questions. It's understanding, hey, we're undertaking this kind of data processing activity and we think X, Y, and Z about this, but we'd love to hear your position on it. And so um, th those are kind of, a, that's a really big highlight of, of my, my job. And um, I can tell you all that all of these kind of tasks that I've mentioned, um, they all involve kind of constant evaluation and recentering around those data protection principles that I shared with you guys earlier. Um, and I bring those to the forefront of almost every conversation that I have with our product teams, um, with our internal teams that handle sensitive data. So you would think about um, that's HR, that's finance, um, that's uh, talent team, people who, anybody who's gonna hold or handle any type of personal data. And so I'm, I'm really excited to talk with you guys about some of the ethics around that and what we do. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure that out. And I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jim or Dr. Malt. Great. Thanks, Danielle. That was great. Uh, very very uh, enlightening. Um, so um, I'm going to project here. Hopefully. Let's make sure you're seeing the right screen. Are you seeing the full screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, so I'm my name is Jim Malt. I'm a uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon by training, and uh, uh, along the way, I got a little distracted and started building medical devices and and uh, companies uh, for medical monitoring. Um, and uh, one of those companies along the way was acquired by uh, Microsoft or uh, uh, something close to that and uh, helped create uh, Health Vault, which is the first cloud-based electronic health record back in 2007. Uh, and, and quite a, an interesting experience in that regard as it relates to uh, devices and, and early wearables and, and health information. Uh, subsequently uh, built a company uh, for remote patient monitoring and care coordination uh, that was ultimately acquired by Qualcomm and uh, I served as the chief medical officer of Qualcomm uh, for five years um, and really helping build out the ecosystem of wireless connectivity to uh, both the wearables and the medical device industry uh, and during that tenure also led our government affairs and health policy uh, programs in Washington and very much involved in, in privacy and security um, issues. Uh, BioIntelliSense is really the culmination uh, of this series of, of work. And it really focused you know, around the fact that as, as clinicians, um, you know, and as a cardiac surgeon uh, doing lung transplants, as you see here, um, it it really um, is a place where uh, we're very accustomed to having a lot of data uh, uh, from monitors in the intensive care unit and in the hospital in general. And then that magical day comes along uh, when the patient gets better and it's time to send them home. Uh, but the, the hard reality is we have no data from patients the moment they leave the hospital. Uh, so when we, we talk about uh, that conundrum, we actually keep people in the hospital uh, unnecessarily longer than, than we otherwise would, but for the fact that 
we're not going to have any information about you. So we keep you in the hospital to monitor you a few extra days or even half a day, just to be sure uh, that you're, you're going to be okay. Um, and, and so this notion of remote monitoring has been uh, around for, for decades, uh, but the practical reality has been such that it was very complicated, too, too expensive, and, and so what you're seeing now is a massive transformation of our healthcare system. And, and as we'll talk about, a lot of that has been, uh, has been uh, accelerated because of the COVID pandemic and the delivery of, of virtual care and remote patient monitoring has been uh, now become the primary means of, of taking care uh, of a lot of, of, of delivery of care that otherwise would have been facility-based. So if we're able to move to remote patient monitoring, um, it has a lot of benefits. It, it, it can take, pe take care of people um, less expensively uh, in a more continuous rather than episodic manner. And also, uh, frankly, be able to deliver care uh, in the convenience uh, of the patient and, and the, the, the consumer rather than uh, the convenience of the institution and the facility. And a lot of great things have happened with the development of wearables over the past decade. Um, but one of them is the fact that wearables are not medical devices. Uh, they're great for fitness and exercise and, and even wellness programs, but uh, they're not really uh, built uh, to, to manage the data as, as it relates to HIPAA privacy and, and other issues, as well as the clinical accuracy and reliability. Um, and in fact, a recent article you know, showed pretty prominently that things like the Apple Watch, uh, which aren't medical devices, they're not built to be, uh, was generating about a 90% false positive rate uh, of of telling people they have irregular heartbeats uh, when they actually didn't have anything of clinical concern. Um, so medical grade really matters uh, when it comes to taking care of, of sick people. And you know it has to be an effortless experience. Uh, it has to be uh, HIPAA secure and, and uh, uh, the transmission issues always come into, into, into concern. Um, and we have programs now around the, the country and around the world, this is at UC Health, that are delivering care virtually. And there's, there's uh, uh, as I said, a, a tremendous uh, adoption of these capabilities over the past uh, eight months. But there are also issues attached to these uh, that we'll talk about here uh, during this uh, panel. Uh, we built a company called BioIntelliSense in order to deliver uh, the world's first medical grade uh, multi-parameter vital signs wearable. Uh, and this device can last for 30 days, uh, be given to patients before they come to the hospital, after they leave the hospital, or chronic disease, monitoring uh, a host of uh, continuous parameters, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And, and obviously along came COVID, and we found ourselves at the center of being able to monitor um, you know, patients in the hospital, patients outside of the hospital uh, and helping uh, keep close track of, of their symptoms and side effects. Um, we launched a, a new device called the BioButton for uh, employer groups and universities and now entire countries uh, that are using this in order to uh, screen and identify symptoms uh, uh, associated with, with COVID infection. Uh, and the device also monitors uh, what we call contact tracing uh, so that uh, when they come in proximity to each other, we know uh, if there's been a COVID exposure, uh, who to contact and, and who to put in quarantine. And all of these things transmit via mobile apps, 
Uh, there's other issues associated with that, as, as you can appreciate. Uh, the data goes up to a, a secure cloud, uh, and then analytics are applied. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously in this arena, uh, HIPAA has a, a, uh, a, 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 a an important concern. Um, and so the data as it relates to all of uh, these systems uh, is fully encrypted even at rest, which is quite unusual uh, for any wearables devices and is encrypted uh, during uh, each segment of transmission uh, under rules of HIPAA. Uh, if there is a data breach and the data uh, stored in, in, in the database is not encrypted, the, the, uh, the fines and, and uh, measures are uh, dramatically different than if the data is encrypted. Um, and so we're hosting in a, a, uh, a, a very secure HIPAA compliant environment. Um, and uh, you know, I, I fully uh, agree with Danielle that key is making sure that, that uh, there's full transparency of the data rights, the data usage, um, and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, privacy policies. I'll stop there and look forward to our conversation. Great, uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I appreciate that. If you can just unshare your screen. Um, as moderator, I'm gonna use my uh, privilege as moderator to ask the first question. And it's kind of a, it's not an ethics question, but I think it's a question that, that informs the ethical discussion. And the first thing is, can each of you very explicitly and succinctly describe the business model for your company, which is where do your revenues come from? And uh, what are the various parties of those revenues, including the people who use your products and any and all third party persons who may in fact pay for access to your data? Danielle, you can go first. Sure. So the struggle of the business model um, uh, has recently switched as of this year, we began um, charging for our services. So our business model is based on a subscription. Uh, we, our athletes, they pay monthly or they might pay annually um, for access to Strava services. Um, additionally, there might be um, partners like for example, somebody who wants to run a challenge on our platform, they might pay for the ability to do that. Um, when they do that, Strava doesn't share personal information with them. Uh, any information that's shared is um, shared specifically by the athlete. They have to um, indicate that they want that information shared. Uh, so they're basically paying for us to kind of set up a challenge for them. Um, recently, uh, we have another arm of, of Strava, which is more dedicated to kind of social impact. And uh, there are certain people, uh, if you meet, if you are a city planner, or if you are working on behalf of a city planner, let's say they've hired you to kind of understand traffic patterns, um, you can get access to our Metro data uh, set uh, for free if you meet those qualifications. Um, so, and that information that they're in, that they can see is it's been depersonalized and it's also um, in the aggregate form. So they're looking at counts. Um, they might take a particular intersection. They might see how many people have gone through that intersection. Um, and we go through a significant amount of kind of statistical uh, magic, I will say, because I'm, I'm not very good with numbers, um, to make sure that we have rounded up in certain situations. And when we can't do that, that data is excluded. Say, for example, if you're looking at a particularly rural area and we don't have a lot of data inputs, uh, that information would be excluded. And on top of that, we also have some kind of um, we're only taking public activities and activities where our athletes have opted in to sharing their data with uh, the Metro project or the global heat map. Thank you. Uh, Jim, can you briefly describe your business model? Sure. So uh, fundamentally, BioIntelliSense is an FDA regulated medical device company. And uh, as such, our devices are uh, originally were purchased by hospitals and health plans and provider groups. Uh, there are actually new uh, CPT codes 
for remote patient monitoring under Medicare uh, fee for service, and now United Healthcare and Aetna, all the commercial payers are are starting to reimburse for the technology as well as incentivize physician practices to to practice uh, telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Um, with the advent of COVID, uh, we, we had a uh, substantial new demand from the non-HIPAA, uh, non-provider arena, as I mentioned earlier, uh, universities and employer groups and entire uh, sovereign countries wanting to be able to use our sticker as the basis of being able to screen uh, for people who are developing symptoms of COVID. Uh, we actually won a multi-million dollar DOD grant for our ability to uh, have a, an algorithm for early detection of COVID-related symptoms. Uh, so as such, uh, we've developed a business model that allows for our devices to be purchased essentially over the counter um, as uh, a, a, you know, think of it as a, a uh, uh, instead of taking somebody's temperature uh, at the restaurant or at the entrance of a facility, we're measuring temperature continuously 1,440 times per day. Uh, and that affords uh, us to have the statistical uh, analytics to be able to see someone developing uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature that may be in, associated with an infectious process. Thank so you. we're doing that as a, a B2B um, or actually a direct consumer uh, you know, uh, device. Um, we make it clear that the data uh, that's collected from someone's vital signs will still nonetheless be treated under a strict HIPAA environment. Uh, encrypted and also uh, the permission grant uh, that allows for any sharing of information by that individual is, is clear and strict. And we've also declared uh, very definitively that we will not under any circumstance uh, resell anyone's data, even de-identified data. We're, we don't have a business model that makes money off of selling data or marketing somebody's data. Thank you. Thank you. So the second question I want to ask is, those of us who are engaged in research um, are required to get something called informed consent. It's not enough to get the consent of someone to participate. We actually have to inform them of the benefits and the risks of engaging in research. What can you tell me about how much do you know about whether the people that sign up to use your product products are truly informed about the privacy protections and the risks and so on of engaging with your company? If I might, Eric, I'd, I'd love to take that one first. Uh, this has been a big uh, area of interest of mine and, and passion uh, dating back to the days of, of health fault um, and, and and there have been efforts even, we worked very closely with the FTC and the ONC um, under, uh, under the federal government to develop a program that's, that's very much like what, what people know now commonly as the food label. And the food label was a great success in uh, over the past, you know, it was a 20 year effort in, in finding a way to have a, a consistent, obvious disclosure of what's in the food that we eat when you buy it at the grocery store. And, and so there is actually uh, an entire initiative that went out of its way uh, with the FTC and ONC. Uh, it was a voluntary program, but it was basically kind of a truth in lending disclosure. So that when people are signing up for privacy policy, you know, data rights and privacy, it's not hidden in all the the legalese and small print, it's, it's right up front says, we are going to sell your data or we're not going to sell your data. It's kind of like a checklist. And mm -hmm. um, I've been the chairman of the Consumer Technology Association uh, uh, Health Technology Division uh, over the last five years. And we actually started a program 
amongst 2,200 tech companies to develop this same kind of disclosure. And we, we actually called it the food label for technology and data uh, program. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yep. We need to get it right. And, um, and, and we need to do, we, we need to take the responsibility for people to know upfront what they're signing up for and, 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 and mm -hmm. true tra transparency Great. and no excuses. Thank you, Jim, Danielle, same question. What can you tell us about the amount, how informed your, your participants are when they agree to use your product? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I, I showed this to you guys earlier a little bit in my presentation is that Strava attempted to make the privacy label for uh, tech companies. And we published that as a part of our privacy notice um, it actually precedes our privacy notice so that you can have like more concise information so that you can really drill down and get to the answers that you want. Um, additionally, I would say that when, um, when Strava has partnered with someone who is doing human subject or research with human subjects, we have um, in, like insisted and made sure that that partner um, undergoes the, the true informed consent process. Um, so I think we recently did a study with Stanford University where they were using uh, Strava data as a part of that, their research, and that went through a full IRB. Um, the subjects that were a part of that, that research were, pre were presented with informed consent where they went through that kind of protocol with, with the, the researchers. Great. Um, thank you. So I'm going to switch to the questions that are now coming in. I'd like to begin with a, a question from very, from, uh, Larry Hunter. Uh, Larry asked, Danielle, very interesting overview. Strava has had a number of major privacy and data related controversies in a fairly short history as a company, including the global heat map that enabled hackers to map military bases, the relief controversy where Strava prohibited users from linking their data to third parties, and so on. He said, um, how do you account for, for this uh, be that given that you are a uh, young company happening repeatedly and more importantly, what are you and the company doing now to be more proactive about potential and future problems? Uh, thanks for that question, Larry. Um, I would say a, a couple things. Uh, one, Strava, we're always reviewing our products. We're looking at them, we're saying, um, are people using this privacy control as it is intended? Um, do they understand the implications of the choice that they're making? Uh, we're constantly providing kind of help articles to guide people along their decisions. And um, we evaluate things all the time and we determine, hey, you know, people were, were interacting with this in a way that we hadn't expected. Um, let's go back to the drawing board. How can we increase kind of education around how this thing works? Um, and, and that's kind of more around our flybys, like uh, with respect to some of our other controversies for LIV and um, the global heat map, a lot of times uh, a, a tweet or something may um, sensationalize something that, that really isn't, um, that there's not that much controversy behind it. Um, and so in order to kind of be proactive, the, the best thing that we can do is educate people and make sure that the selections that they're making in our product are what they are intending to make and making sure that we're very clear about that. Um, and then I would say like the last piece is making sure that like if something is not working right, we, we are always open to kind of like looking at that and saying, how can we redesign this? How can we make this better? And I'd also say that kind of compliance is, is, is an ongoing process. You never just say, hey, I'm compliant and I'm done. It's always kind of moving towards, can we make this better? Can we make this more clear? How can we be more transparent? So um, I would say it's a continual process. We're, we're a small company, we're under 200 employees. So, um, the more that we can do, the more that we can evaluate that, the more that we can focus our, our product teams on privacy by design and those principles, um, the better that we're gonna get at this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jim, here's a question from Judy Friedman who asks, how do you prevent the data from getting to insurance companies and ex employers? And then a follow-up question says, families argue against patients coming home too early because the burden of care falls to them, uh, who, to, to the family members who are often untrained 
uh, and so on. And it just disappeared on me. And here it is. Um, <laughs> this obviously saves money for healthcare, but not for the families. Um, can you comment on one, how you prevent this data from getting there? And two, on have you created a technology that is simply shifts the burden of care from the healthcare institutions to families without providing them appropriate compensation for doing so? Great question. So the, take the first one. Um, as I described earlier, there's kind of two different worlds that we're living in right now, but let's talk about the healthcare world. In the healthcare world, uh, data from the medical device is ordered by a physician in the first place or from a hospital. Uh, that is what's called a, a covered entity. Those are the, the, the providers of care. Um, our, our order from them is to provide that device and then the data from that device that helps them take care of that patient. Uh, the involvement of the insurance company is obviously under what's called a business associates agreement uh, that allows for the exchange of that information uh, between the provider organization and, and the, the payer or the insurance company. Uh, in most cases, there's a firewall between employer groups and insurance companies uh, relative to the data uh, for the individual. In that other world that we're living in right now, uh, employees that be wearing the sticker, they have sole control over the data uh, that's collected from the sticker and they have to actively choose to whether or not that data can be shared uh, to any third party, whether it's their employer or their family. As it relates to remote patient monitoring and, and uh, you know, hospital discharge, um, you know, there, there's, there's always a balance between, uh, you know, risk and benefit, right? And, and so if, you're, if, if I've got a family member who's in the hospital, um, the, the truth is every hour that my family member is in the hospital is an hour that is exposing my family member to more nasty bacteria and viruses uh, that allow them to become sicker and ultimately die. It's called nosocomial infections. And, and the fact of the matter is patients we've learned are far better off getting out of the hospital as soonest and safely as possible. Um, and back in my day, when I was a, a, a young surgical resident at Duke, um, patients getting cardiac surgery used to spend 10 days in the hospital after cardiac surgery. And, uh, you know, and over periods of time, we learned that getting these patients up and out of the intensive care unit out of the hospital in four, four days after heart surgery had dramatic improvements in their outcomes of so the reduced infections and reduced pneumonias and so forth. So there is a tremendous benefit, not to mention convenience. I don't know how many families love driving to the hospital and parking and having to, to you know, go through all that hassle to visit a family member. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to make it easier to take better care of people, no matter where they are, and and make it. The other problem is is the episodic nature of care. You know, you basically sooner or later you have to leave the hospital, and then you're on your own. And now we can say, hey, with a simple sticker, you know, our doctors and nurses can actually be alerted if there's something starting to develop. So that means the family doesn't have to know what to look for. And, and the family actually loves this because it's like this, this warm blanket that follows the patient into the home. And, and then the family doesn't have the, the pressure and anxiety of trying to remember what they're supposed to watch for. Okay, Ira, are you uh, ready with a question? Sure, I'd be happy to um, come into uh, one here from the um, from the uh, chat. Give me one moment, please. Okay. Hmm. 
you've got a lot of buttons open here. Okay, thank you. Um, so this one is for um, both of you. Uh, it's a follow-up to one that uh, Danielle had answered um, about the past controversies. Those were due to uh, unexpected uses. Um, how can um, we as users and um, companies uh, do better at anticipating surprising uses of personal data? Um, so I'll start with that one. Um, as far as users, one of the best things that we can do is really engage and understand how companies are using our data. And the best way to do that, I know it's really boring, is to read those privacy statements. And um, as you go through those and you don't, and something's unclear, um, every company has somebody that's there that's accountable, that's willing to kind of answer your questions with respect to what's going on with your data. So you, we have to engage as consumers. We have to understand how a company is using our data so that we can decide, hey, I might not want to use might not want to use this function, or I might not want to connect my, I don't know, my Alexa to my Uber account because I, I don't really um, consent to the data sharing that's required for that, that type of connection. Um, as far as companies, what can we do? I think the best thing that companies can do is try to be as transparent as possible with their users. Um, I think it's providing them um, in time notification so that when somebody is selecting something, they receive some sort of pop-up so that they can understand, hey, by doing X, Y might be shared um, so that people can really understand the implications of what's going on and so that they can see how am I showing up in the world? Um, I think California has tried, you know, made an attempt to help consumers with that by um, implementing and enacting the uh, CCPA, which provides certain kind of information rights with respect to your data. It, make, it makes companies tell you if they're selling your data or not. Um, so I think from the regulatory perspective, we can do stuff too. So companies can be more transparent. Uh, we can have uh, greater privacy protections in terms of a kind of a national law um, and users can engage fully with um, the information that companies are sharing with them. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Rich Brody. Um, there have been many reports of medical devices and other devices getting hacked. Do you have any concerns or do you feel that your security vulnerabilities have been eliminated uh, for either both the medical or for the athlete reasons, uh, users? Sure, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, it, it's, it's always a cat and mouse game uh, between, you know, cybersecurity and, and, uh, you know, transmission of, of data and access to data. So, you know, foundationally, there's a big difference between uh, a device such as ours, which is passive data monitoring versus a, a device like a, an insulin pump or, or a defibrillator. When you start talking about implantable devices, uh, that's where it, it gets very, very significant because those devices can actually kill somebody actively uh, if they're hacked into. Same thing with infusion pumps and so forth. Um, so there are, are I, I would say, uh, significant uh, efforts and concerns on the part of the FDA and the cybersecurity rules to address that. Um, and uh, they're, they're getting stronger and stronger. And I think there's a lot of collaboration and cooperation in that regard. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions that has popped up routinely is the fact that um, if we think about the drug world, um, there are many laws that govern what drug companies do to promote their products and services. And yet people who watch this world know very well that drug companies, virtually all of the major drug companies have often in routine uh, settlements and findings for them breaking the law in the marketing of drugs. And the reason they do is pretty simple. They do it because it's profitable. They know that by passing the law, they'll eventually get caught, they'll eventually pay a fine, but that fine will be le less, much less than they make engaging in bad behavior. What can you tell me about why your companies, as you stated, have chosen to put these principles ahead of your uh, financial 
uh, duties to, to sell your products and raise money. How do you as an organization ensure that that quest for profit does not uh, violate both laws and the agreements of the people with which you have partnered in these transactions? Danielle? Would... <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great question. Um, I think it really comes back to um, you have to start kind of at the very beginning. What am I here to do? Um, Strava's mission is to connect athletes to what motivates them the most. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a part of our mission is being athlete centric and thinking about kind of putting yourself in that position. And, and that's something that we kind of carry through. We really think about, you know, we put ourselves, we're active Strava users. We think about, hey, would I expect this? Would I want this? And I think that guides a lot of our decisions in terms of um, <clears throat> whether, you know, if we're going to balance the business interests over their privacy interests. I also think that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, one of the things that we've seen is the more that we invest in privacy and trust, the better our brand gets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so keeping that in mind, it just like, it, it, it keeps privacy at the forefront and it, and it helps us kind of de-escalate or un unweight some of those business concerns that might be driving the privacy concerns down. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I would agree with Danielle that, you know, in fact, just the, uh, the, the realization that most medical devices don't, don't encrypt the data uh, on the device itself, you know, it was, was quite shocking to us. And, and it's become a, a, a real selling proposition that we take those at issues, you know, almost to the extreme in making sure that all the data is encrypted. There's no, you know, even if somebody hacked into one of our devices, it wouldn't matter because they couldn't see the data. And that's become a real business advantage. So I think, I think what we talk about is privacy and security by design and transparency by design. And you'll see that that's actually a, 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 a business advantage um, that's appreciated by the, the payers and, the, and the, uh, the providers and consumers. Great. Um, there's a question here from Andrew, which is, I think this is a very provocative question, which says, are there any stop gap, uh, Danielle, are there any stop, stop gaps in place, legal or otherwise, to prevent an investment group from purchasing your company simply for the data that you hold? Ah, uh, well, that's a, a really good question. I'm not sure that I'm the best person um, to answer with respect to what types of legal or otherwise kind of agreements there. Um, in terms of stock gaps, there are kind of regulatory things that we would have to follow with respect to the GDPR in terms of um, providing notice. And I think that we have seen what happens when you don't or you inadequately inform um, a company. I think, I believe Facebook had this issue uh, with its acquisition of WhatsApp and then they faced um, <clears throat> regulatory action um, under the GDPR with respect to not informing their customers. So there are some kind of external laws that help with that process um, and they're kind of imposed on the company as opposed to those um, existing naturally within a company. I wouldn't be able to speak to that. You'd have to speak to a Strava lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ira, did you have a question? Yes, I did actually. Um, it's actually from Matt Winia. Um, and uh, his question is an interesting one involving um, the relationship between private and, and governmental regulation. Uh, sometimes the, uh, a product is, is so helpful and so beneficial that it's almost um, not really a choice to use it. So, you know, in that question, in that situation, when does government need to maybe jump in with some regulation? on the data privacy. And I, I believe that is, um, uh, I think essentially what Matt was, uh, was getting at. Let me just real uh, quickly start with that. He said, transparency and choice are important, but they have limited utility 
when the products offer significant health benefits. Um, it's almost, you might almost view it as coercion to use the, uh, the product because you, you need it so, so much for your health. Um, is it increasingly important then to have regulatory standards rather than just transparency and consumer choice as protective devices? Yeah, this is a really important issue, and, and it's it's become quite germane uh, with 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 the COVID pandemic, as you can appreciate, uh, because on a public health level, you know, even our cell phones can keep track of where we are, what zip code we live in, and and frankly, whether or not we're having exposures to each other. And in some countries, uh, they've mandated that that information be available to uh, public health officials in order to manage, you know, COVID outbreaks, and and Taiwan and South Korea have been magnificent in their management of of uh, COVID. But, you know, on the other side of the coin is simply the the privacy and uh, and and uh, you know uh, uh, kind of rights of the individual in the United States to that balance that out. And I think it's really interesting. We went through this same thing. If you know, if you think about it right now, it, your medication history is in a database at Walgreens and CVS and at your insurance company. Um, but when you, if you're at, you know, at an amusement park or <laughs> pre-COVID, uh, you hit your head and they wheel you into the emergency room. Uh, uh, you know, at the local uh, hospital, um, they'll be able to pull down your Starbucks transactions, but they can't see what medications or or allergies you have in order to save your life. Um, and you know, so there's a balance between you know restricting the flow of information. We have to be a little bit careful, um, kind of shutting down or creating so such harsh barriers that that information that could save your life is just not readily accessible because the rules are are such that it's it's impossible to get to and that's a lot of what's happened with GDPR is actually shutting down the ability for data to flow and be interoperable that could save people's lives okay uh, thank you we have uh, we have time for I think one last question. Um, and, you know, it's really, I want to thank everyone for the really great questions. There's so many questions here. We, we can't possibly get, get to all of them. We've, I've tried to, to skip through them and really try ones that hit different aspects. Um, I, I think I want to finish up with a question here from, uh, it looks like Abigail, um, Dr. Malt, for those devices which could be used to harm individ which could be used to harm individuals if they were hacked into or misled. What type of cyber protection is in the development and how can we know something like this is sufficiently safe and secure? Yeah, as we described earlier, there, there are uh, very significant groups within FDA now. Actually, you know, we just went through FDA clearance a, a few months ago with our most recent device. And there's actually a category in the FDA that now scrutinizes your cybersecurity measures for your device. Um, and as I said earlier, it's, it's an ongoing cat and mouse battle, uh, but uh, it's, again, it's, 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 uh, it's been manageable. The, the, there's a lot more, I would call it, concern than there is examples of, of uh, you know, true harm in that regard. Well, we are officially at time as moderator. I want to thank everyone for attending. I also want to thank Danielle and Jim for taking the time to come and talk with us today. And I will turn it over to Ira for closing comments. And I would like to reiterate what uh, Eric just said. Uh, we have uh, over 200 people here in attendance. And uh, I hope that we got to most of the uh, questions and most of the topics. We've really enjoyed this. And I wanted to also send a thank you out to Danielle Caldwell of Strava and Jim Malt of BioIntelligence and to our colleagues at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities who are working on the tech today and also uh, worked hand in hand in, in putting together such a great program. Thanks, Matt. 
and uh, and your staff. Uh, it's a great collaboration that uh, the business school and the Anschutz Medical Campus now have, especially with the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. Uh, so I think what we'll be doing is signing off now. A recording will be available and you'll get an email from everyone who registered will get an email with the link to the recording. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody.